All right. Well, we are right at our start time. So I think we'll go ahead and get started, although I anticipate that we'll have even more people joining us. So um, once again, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where in the world you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to the BGS Advantage webinar series, which is brought to you in part by the generous support of our partner, KPMG. My name is Christina Ulrich, and I'm the Executive Director of Beta Gamma Sigma, and I would like to personally thank all of you for joining BGS and AICPA and SEMA for this webinar, Off, off Script, Mastering the Art of Business Improv. AICPA and SEMA have been outstanding partners to BGS, with one of their main goals being helping our members gain access to key insights into emerging topics in finance and accounting. After this webinar today, I encourage you to check out the AICPA and SEMA member benefits page on the BGS website. There you'll find some information on the BGS member access to their digital mindset pack, which aims to help participants build competencies in those emerging technologies and topics. Our team uh, will drop the link in the chat now for easy reference. And at the end of our presentation, we'll also be joined by Barry Payne, who's the Director of External Relations Management Accounting. Uh, for AACPA and SEMA, and he'll share a little bit more information about these additional resources and our ongoing partnership. During our presentation today, I want to encourage you to continue to interact with one another in the chat. Um, if you have questions at all during our presentation, please drop those in the Q&A section. Keeping the comments and the questions separate will ensure that we can get to as many questions as possible. Our speaker will be interacting with you during the presentation, and we'll have dedicated time toward the end um, to make sure that we're answering any of those lasting questions. With no further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Margaritas, the author of Improv is No Joke, Taking the Numb Out of Numbers, as well as his recent book, Off Script, Mastering the Art of Business Improv, which we're here to hear more about today. One of Peter's goals is to have business leaders remember that we are in the people business first and improv leadership strengthens that critical relationship because there's no business without people. Peter has a BBA from the University of Kentucky and a master's degree in accountancy from Case Western Reserve University. He's a licensed non-practicing CPA in Ohio. Peter has worked for companies such as PwC, Ohio Dominican University, and Victoria's Secret Catalog, although he's asked me to note not in a modeling capacity, as you may have assumed. Peter is generously offering his book, Off Script, Mastering the Art of Business Improv, to all attendees of this webinar at a special discounted price of $2.99 USD. And that offer is valid until Tuesday, April 26th at 12.01 a.m. Eastern time. So if you're interested, our staff just dropped the special Amazon link into the chat, and we'll provide that again at the end in case you miss it. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Peter Margaritas. Thank you very much. And, and just a, a, as a note, it's the Kindle version of my book that I'm able to offer at, at $2.99. So thank you all very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, so when I talk about business improv, or just the word improv, people go, oh, that's all about comedy. Oh, what's that guy's name? Drew Carey. What else do you think about when I say improv? And I hear, you know, winging it. I hear, you know, making stuff up. I hear being quick on your feet. The only one that doesn't really apply is making things up because we don't make things up. Despite what Drew Carey said, in the show, Whose Line Is It Anyway, where everything is made up and the points don't count. It's actually just the opposite. But the one thing that, well, here's, here's a secret. It's probably the, one of the key pieces to improv that most people don't even know is that theater improvisers do rehearse and do practice what they are doing. And it's not one time, they do it over and over and over again under different scenarios. So by the time they get up on stage, no matter what is thrown at them, they can adjust, adapt and react to it without being knocked off their platform. Which seems contradictory to the term improv. Well, business improv is the exact same thing. We over-prepare 
in order to walk into a room, walk into a meeting, walk into a presentation, and in essence, take that script that we've been working with and wad it up and throw it away. We do this because we want to interact with the audience. And when we see that audience losing interest, when we see that audience, as I like to say, if I'm speaking at a conference, begin to begin the conference prayer, that conference prayer is taking their phone out, bowing their heads and being distracted by email, angry birds or whatever. We have to be able to react to it. And I think this is a big challenge leaders have is going off script. So did you know, this is, this is probably the best kept secret in US history. Did you know that Martin Luther King improvised the I Have the Dream speech. He did. I researched it. I found an article that stated it. I, I, I researched it, and he absolutely improvised the I Have the Dream speech. Now, let me explain. Back in 63, the night before the March on Washington, Dr. King and his inner circle were preparing, going through the speech, making sure everything was going well and, and written well. And they get about two thirds of the way through and they go, you know, we've been doing this. I have a dream portion for about six, seven, eight months. I think we've overdone it. One of his, one of his inner circle members said, and, and I think we should take it out and write something else to put in. And they did. So the next day, and, and if you find a, a, the entire video of his speech, you'll see when this happens. So the next day, as he's given this speech and he's reading it up from the podium, looking down, looking up, looking down, looking up, about two thirds through, he's not getting the response he, he, need, he wanted from that audience. The, the response was polite, but it wasn't what, what he, he expected. And he knew he needed to do something. So at one point, about two thirds of the way through, he paused for a moment. And the gospel singer for that day was, was a friend of Dr. King's named Mah Mahalia Jackson. And when she saw him pause, she said, tell me about your dream, Martin. Now, I found research which a few people on that stage heard her say, I can, can't verify that Dr. King did, but at that exact same moment, he took his script and pushed it away. And this is where he goes into the I have the dream speech. And if you watch the video, he never looks down from that point on. And he got the reaction that he wanted. He went completely off script. And because he was over prepared, he had the I dream, I, I dream, I have a dream speech in his DNA and his mind. He easily substituted that in. Oh, by the way, that speech was originally titled normalcy never again so we need to think like dr king because this is not about us delivering this is about us delivering a message but it's also more important about the audience receiving that message we're trying to deliver and a lot of times we as leaders are delivering this message and we can see people become disengaged but we just plow through until it's over this is a prime opportunity to go off script as long as we are well prepared, over prepared, and have thought through different parts, what if this doesn't, what if I'm not getting to the audience? What else can I bring in? What else can I put in? Okay. So this is about applied improv. Those who can improvise can be very funny, but this is taking the, the tenets of improv, the foundations of improv, and bringing it into the business world and applying it. Because the foundation, the overall foundation are three pieces, respect, trust, and support. In improv, I, have to have, I should have respect for, for the people on my team. I should have respect for those in, uh, who I report to. You know what you call a situation that neither side respects each other? The US political system. I'll pause for the laughter, but it's true. Trust needs to be there. I need to be able to trust my team, trust the people around me, and they should be able to trust me. And as a leader, I'm there to support them and what they need, and they also help support me. If any one of those three are out of place, this doesn't work. Right? 
And this is the key. This is the glue that holds everything together. And I'm going to go into a lot of detail about yes and. Yes and is about agreement, but not always agreeing. And I'll leave it for that for right now. But we'll talk more about that. Listening and focus. This, these are the superpowers in improv, the ability to listen, to understand, and be present, focused in the moment, and not distracted. Because when we do all of this, we can adapt to any given situation. Now, I would, I would ask the audience, how many of you think that you might be an improviser? And if you, if you think so, drop it into the chat box. Just a Y for yes and an N for no. Do you think you're an improviser? I get a lot of whys. That's good. There's a few ends. Perfect. So, you know, we just went through the greatest improv exercise ever. It's called the pandemic. Every day was a new day. We had to improvise. We had to adapt. We had to change direction every single day, especially on the outset, in order to get to the end of this. We are all improvisers. We are all born improvisers. Some of us do it more, some of us do less, but there's times that come up that we weren't prepared for. How do we react to it? And my purpose here is to have you recognize that you all are improvisers. Now let's figure out how we can use it strategically. So I have a video here from a gentleman, um, Dave Morris, who's an improviser, and he's speaking at a TEDx conference in, in Victoria. And I've got two clips. And this one is about what improv is all about. It's about the yes and. Uh, the next step is probably the most agreed upon rule of all of improvisation, across all schools of thought, is to say yes. So we're going to do a fun little demonstration, because that's way more fun than me talking about it. Uh, what I need you all to do is just say yes for me on the count of three. Can you do that? One, two, three. Yes. Oh, that was good. With feeling. One, two, three. Yes. Good. Uh, so now uh, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to just say yes to those questions. <laughs> and we'll see what happens, OK? Let's just, let's just go with me here. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Do you want to tell a story with me? Yes. Is this story about a knight? Yes. Is this knight wearing shining armor? Yes. Is he going to save a damsel? Yes. Is she being held by a dragon? Yes. Is the dragon breathing fire? Yes. Does he save her with courage and bravery? Yes. And do they live happily ever after? Yes. Oh, isn't that great? Nice work. Nice work. That was really good. We did that. We just did that. All right, now let's do it again. And this time I want you to say no. Everybody, just say no to what I'm about to say. You ready? <laughs> yeah, good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to tell a story with me? No. <laughs> I'll just go. All right. I'll get on. What are your thoughts on that video? What do you what do you what are you hearing him saying? What did you witness? If you could drop that in the chat box, that would be awesome. The audience is engaged. Thank you, Chris. Ah, Stacy, you have to be open to possibilities. No closes all opportunities. Yes keeps conversation. Oh my God, you guys are just awesome here. You got buy-in, the positivity around yes. You have more opportunity stories to say yes. No stops. Yes and no, no stopped him in his tracks. Continues the conversation. No is a non-starter. Getting, getting to yes is difficult. I, absolutely, because we, we tend to be wired to say no. And, and if there's anybody in the accounting profession out there, we have a stereotype. That stereotype is we say no a lot, so much so that the, the head of the finance and accounting piece is usually called the CFO, except now it's replaced with the CF no. So how many of you, and, and this is just something I want you to think through, and thank you, Tim, you need to be adaptive as well. How many of you would consider yourself a yes person or a no person? And for those of you who think maybe I'm more of a no person, how could you begin to take this video and apply it in, in, in the right situations 
and become more of a yes person. I'm sorry, we, we can't do that. Why? Well, this is the way we've always done it. Well, that's another way of saying no. How can we, and I'll help here in a second, but he was just using yes. But we need the and portion. We need the and portion because yes is agreement and we're going to add on to it. And that add on should be in a positive way, not a negative way. So with that and also, well, I'll back up. It is my feeling that yes and properly used can be a better way of saying no to somebody because you're having somewhat of a conversation about the topic. But there's one instance that yes and does not apply. Absolutely does not apply. And if that is someone taking you across your ethical boundaries, then it's whatever adjective you had and no. Outside of that, I rarely use no. It's taken a long time. This is, this is, not, this is not easy. This takes time. And you've heard that, that, that term, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So this is the process. This is the process I've been on for 20 plus years once I, once I found my world of improv. So this is a video of myself and a colleague of mine, Roxanne, and we're doing this improv exercise, no because, yes but, and yes and. So we've got a topic of going out to brunch. We have a dialogue and the first set of dialogue, I respond no because and give a reason. She responds no because and gives another reason. We do this for a few, a few about six, 30 seconds. Same conversation, now we change it, the response to yes but, same methodology. And then the last one is changing it to yes and. And here we go. So Peter, after we finish our conversation today, what do you say we go out for, for a nice brunch? Uh, no, because I'm, I'm kind of fearful of restaurants right now. No, because why? I mean, it's all the social distancing. There's, there's all kinds of safety measures in place. No, because I don't want to catch COVID-19. Well, no, because you're not going to catch COVID-19, because you're going to be in all the right places doing all the right things. You're going to have your mask on. You're going to be socially distanced. No, because I don't want to take any chances, because being a diabetic, if I happen to catch it, I could die. No, because you're not going to be that close to anybody. Come on, you're going to be fine. I think we should go to brunch. Okay, and very good. <laughs> That was now all was, right? That was weird. perfect. Okay. Uh, now we're going to do yes, but. Pitch the same, same thing. Same thing. Yeah. But we're going to try to take some different choices this time. Different Instead choices? Of, different choices. Because uh, you're going to pitch the same line to me. But instead of me saying, I'm, I'm fearful of restaurants, I'm going to do yeah. something different. No. Okay. Yeah. So, Peter, after we finish our call today, uh, what do you say we go out and have a nice brunch? Yes, but I'm not a brunch person. Yes, but you should be. Have, I mean, have you ever tried this before? Do you, do you go out for brunch often or do you make brunch often? Uh, yes, but I prefer either it's breakfast or it's lunch. This in-between kind of, that's where chicken, uh, fried chicken and waffles came from. That's a, a product of a brunch. And I just not. Yes, but if you if you tried it, if you really did an authentic brunch, I think you would take a whole new attitude. You would have a whole new approach to it. I really think you should give it a try. Yes, but I'm OCD and I like my things just in place. I, brunch does not fall into my vocabulary. Yes, well, but we can make it fall into your category if we just try it and practice it a few times. And you can even separate your food on your plate. So it's all in line, too. And we'll set it up at a time during the day that, that will fit within your other requirements. End of scene. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> uh, so we're going to do the same thing again, but this time okay. with yes and. And we're going to make different choices. Very good. So, Peter, after we finish our conversation today, uh, let's go. Let's go out and get some brunch. What do you say? Yes, and I love brunch. 
brunch is my favorite meal. Let's do that. Yes, and tell me more about that. Why is it your is it your favorite meal? Do you, is it the eggs or the or the what is it? Because you, I love breakfast. Yes, and I love breakfast. It's one of my favorite meals as well as lunch. And the ability to marry the two of them, man. Let's go. Yes, and we will. Let's go to Joe's Diner. They have the best brunch I've ever had in my life. Yes, and an after brunch. You know what? Because I do eat a lot during brunch. I think we need to take a take a walk. Oh yes, and let's go down to the Metro Parks and see what they have going on down there. We can stay socially distanced. Yes, and that's a great idea. Let's just do that. Yes, and let's do it now. <laughs> let's do it now. Boom. There you go. Okay. So when I ask audiences, what did you what did you witness during the no because? Basically, it, it all comes down to a roadblock. It was, it was too combative. You know, I, it was, thank you. It was negative. Okay. There, there was no progress. And you can even tell by our body language. All right. And fear. Yes, but it's a little bit in between. But the word no and but are negative and they invoke negative emotions. But the yes and kept the conversation going forward in a positive direction, exploring opportunities, exploring ideas. It's a, it's a journey. So my question to you is how can you apply this yes and exercise to your daily business and personal life? What, how can you bring this, apply this to you as you're beginning to learn about business improv? And if you could drop that in the chat for me, please. And Sydney had, with yes, and the conversation has potential to develop and grow. Otherwise, we keep on turning circles. That's correct. A bit, I'm a bit miffed. What if I don't wish to say yes? And my question would be, why? Why would you not want to say yes to at least explore? That's, that's kind of the exercise. Let's explore the idea. I don't have to agree with it at the end, but at least I can explore it. And at some point, Nora, at some point, it, you could come out and say, yeah, well, yes, and I think I'm just going to take a pass for now, but I appreciate the conversation. Okay, let's see. Uh, that's an interesting idea. It tells me more. Yes, but it was a lot more collaborative than no because. Liberating, takes the pressure off to explore. Uh, yes, seems to be, re yes, seems to reduce to resistance. Keeping an open mind, receiving all the info for parties, correct. So your challenge after this is done is one, listen to your internal dialogue. Are you a yes? and person or you a no because and i'll just leave them at those two for right now and if you tend to be a no because how can you reframe that and a yes and to at least explore the opportunity all the while if you're going from one meeting to the next and someone stops you says do you have a few minutes i'd like to discuss something with you you leave in one meeting you go into the next you're, you're, you're preoccupied you're distracted the answer could be yes, and can we schedule this for a later time? I'm on my way to a meeting. I'll be distracted. Let's get time on my calendar today, and we can sit and discuss. Okay. All right. Uh, play the yes, and role with the first character who's afraid of catching COVID, or the second one not likely to brunch. How would that work? Yes, and I will be double masked and... Make, and I will make sure that we're six feet apart would be the way I would yes and that. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other things I said during that as it relates to COVID. I don't want to catch COVID. Uh, or yes, and, you know, brunch is not my favorite because that's where chicken and waffles came in. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to give it another try. I, I, I don't really like it, but since you're, Roxanne, since you really like the idea of a brunch, 
for you, I'll give it one try. And I will give you a, a personal thing that happened. I do not like sweet potatoes. I've never liked sweet potatoes. I just don't like the texture. And my mother is a, was, a, was a dog on a bone about me having sweet potatoes since I was five years old. She was up on a visit and it was Thanksgiving uh, 2020. And she wanted me to try sweet potatoes. And I immediately went, no, and I went, okay, no, wait, wait, hold on. Yes, and I will give them a try. As well as I was a real big Brussels sprouts fan. So I said, yes, and I'll give them a try. Brussels sprouts won. I still didn't like, I still didn't like sweet potatoes, but at least I made the attempt. Okay. I hope that also helps in defining this. Okay. Listening. That's, uh, I think that's Norris. Uh, Beagle, Lollipop, who's 13 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, listening is something that we are not good at a lot of times. There's two types of listening. There's listening to respond and listening to understand. Listening to under, well, I will, I will let Dave talk a little bit more about the listening and I'll follow after this video. Uh, the next step is listening. Uh, you, you've all probably heard of that phrase or something similar about how we have two ears and two eyes and one mouth, so we should listen and watch twice as much as we speak, right? You know that? Not true. Most people listen just enough to be able to respond. But we don't listen with every part of our being to what they're saying. A very wise man once told me that listening That listening is the willingness to change. If I'm not willing to change based on what you're telling me, I'm not really listening. I've already made up my mind. I've decided how I feel. I've decided what I think. And I'm just going to let you talk at me, and then I'm going to respond. But improvisers listen with every part of their being, because we're present in that moment. I'm there with you as you're speaking to me. Uh, I'm willing. I don't have to change, but I'm willing to change. Improv is a collaborative art form. And collaboration means taking yourself out of the equation, getting that ego about what you believe and what you think out of the way so that instead of it being your idea and my idea, it becomes the first idea and the second idea and the third idea. We're just going to listen and react and change. We listen to respond. And when we listen to respond at times, we interrupt. And if I ask this question, how many of you like to be interrupted? All of you, most of you, all of you would say, I don't like being interrupted. Then I say, well, let me ask this question. How many of you are interrupters? And that's when the face gets a little crimson going, yeah, I'm a kind of an interrupter. Right. Listening to understand it is exactly what, how, how he described it. It's, it's being there, listening to understand, parking our ego, parking our agenda, parking our biases, and just being there in the moment, not distracted, and giving our all, all being and just listening to what they have to say, even though I may not agree with it, but they have a voice. And you know, I, in the book, I, I write, there's a, um, a survey out there that says 78% of people leave their jobs because of lack of appreciation. The ability to listen to another person and their ideas without any judgment or bias is an act of appreciation and people want to be heard. People want to be heard. So see if you become a better listener. So would you say that you're a listen to understand person or listen to respond person? And if you could drop your answer into the chat box, and for those of you who have questions, please, please, use, uh, please use the Q&A box for that. And Chris, for the, um, this type of dialogue, let's put that in the chat box. So there's a couple of questions that come up from the yes and portion. I want to make sure that I get back to them at the end. OK. Listen to understand, listen to understand. Oh, good. We got a lot of listeners here. Some interrupters, and I love I love that we're how transparent we are doing this. 
Yeah, Temple, that's easy to do. And when I when I have a little bit of both at times, I'm a better listener as a as a business person. When it comes to raising a teenager, I had to I had to really work hard. I'm not just responding all the time, but listening to understand. Uh, James asked the question, should we never listen to respond? My answer would be correct. My answer is if we can become better listeners to understand, we can at least absorb and understand what the person is saying, even though we might not agree or even know that we might not be able to do whatever, but by by responding or stopping them and you chiming in, that interruption doesn't make them feel good. We didn't give them a voice. And basically your opinion meant more. This is, the, this is what they're hearing. This is what they're feeling. Well, your opinion means more than mine. And, you know, if you ask me a question um, again, or ask me for my ideas and I give you an idea and you shoot it down, like that's listening to respond, then I'm going to quit giving ideas. And we use that a lot when we do creativity sessions. Accept what the person says and then add on to it. Accept and add on to it. So we've got, uh, this is a yes and, and listening exercise. It's called one word story. The three of us, myself, Roxanne's back in the picture and Tyler, uh, wait, who's actually a CPA, uh, we are gonna create a story from scratch. And the ability to do this is I have to listen to understand. I, I can't get in front of the conversation. To listen to understand, accept what's given to me, and add something to the story, albeit it might be a little off kilter. The mouse jumped up on my lap and bit my shoulder. And I screamed. Hallelujah. Because I saw my shadow screaming back at the window pane which confused the mouse and then my little brain exploded. Clearly we were having fun with that, but did you see Tyler's reaction to when the mouse was in the lap bit Roxanne's shoulder. He he paused for a moment because he was not expecting that. Expecting that he bit him in the bit in the lap, but she threw a curveball, and he paused for a moment and just ex accepted that and added on to it. Just accepted that and added on to it. It's part of that listening. This is one of my. Uh, next to a couple of my favorite listening exercises that, that I use. And this type of exercise right here, I would equate it to, we're going to do a brainstorming session. I want everybody, I want my team to get together and we're going to do a brainstorming session. Now in, in improv, there's two types of listening, cognitive listening and um, Oh, God, I just went blank. <laughs> They'll come back to me. The one type, the listening that I just uh, went blank on, it's where there are no rejections. There's no uh, uh, devil's advocate. We can't say we can't do that. Um, or that's not possible. All that negativity is taken out. We want quantity of ideas, not quality. 
quantity of ideas. And yes, and in this one word story kind of exercise, give me your idea, we're gonna accept that. Uh, John Rupp, it's active listening, but there's a, another term for that. Thank you. And I still have drawn a blank. I'll, at the next video, I'll, I will see if I can bring that out of my memory. So when we're doing creative stuff and we're brainstorming to come up with ideas, we have this listening over here that's, that's positive. We're not negative. We're not shooting ideas down. We're not criticizing. We're suspending judgment. And then we've got cognitive listening, which now let's take a look at those ideas. Now let's criticize them. Let's, let's see what could work and what won't work. But if we don't, if we, in this active listening acceptance sphere over here, if somebody gives me an idea, somebody gives me an idea and I shoot it down and I keep shooting it down and shooting down ideas, how likely are you able to, when somebody calls like, do you have an idea? I'm not giving you anything. You're just gonna say no. So if we put them in two separate buckets, it goes a long way. <clears throat> so in the chat box, tell me how you think you can apply this in your personal and, and, and business life. How can you use this in your daily life? And brainstorm, uh, no, brainstorming sessions, you know, we think, oh, brainstorm, I got to like, you know, block out an hour of my time. We don't need that. A brainstorming session could be, we got 10 minutes. And, and this is the problem we need to solve. Give me your ideas. A lot of times we think, oh, brainstorming session, I got to block out an hour of my calendar. Right? And it's a discussion that might not occur otherwise. Many bits of time, energy are things up right, right? Thank you. Well, while you are answering, be more open to new ideas. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Thank you, John. I knew a John Rupp down in Florida. It was a, we were in banking together. Um, this next exercise, lifting exercise, is called last word spoken, where the last word in one person's sentence becomes the first word in the other person's sentence. Okay, so, and this is Christian Ramp. He's also a CPA at Grand Rapids, uh, uh, Michigan. The other day I was out in my driveway and my kids were riding their bikes in circles the whole time. Time of day is important when you want to ride a bike because riding your bike at night can be very dangerous. Dangerous activities are a cornerstone of childhood bike riding. Riding. I like riding bikes. I don't really like riding horses. Horses are another form of transportation that humans have used even longer than bicycles and they are nearly as effective. Effective communication is something that people say they do, but they're really poor at doing it consistently. Consistently communicating, consistently choosing effective transportation, all of these are skills that individuals need as they grow and develop in their careers. End of scene. So why do you, well, the purpose of this exercise is to not get in front of the conversation, not predict where the conversation is going to go, is to listen to the last word, take that last word and create something with it. A lot of conversations we get into, we're predicting where it's going to go or what we should say next. And when we do that, our listening declines. It doesn't hide, hyper, it doesn't extend up, it goes down. And we become distracted by that internal talk. So the ability to listen to that last word, and th this is good when you're networking with people, just listen to what they say at the last word and then kind of respond not to the last word they're saying, unless you find out they're an improviser and you can have some fun with them. 
I've had this happen to me a number of times, but this is all about being active listeners. It's about trying to understand what the issue is at hand, it's exploring, being inquisitive, leaning in, trying to try, you know, I'm fine. There's more to that than you're just fine. But being present and showing empathy. Now, empathy is not one person trying to trying to put themselves in your shoes. Empathy is about you trying to understand how you feel in your shoes. So same question. How do you think you can apply this in your daily business and personal life? How can you, how can you become a better listener? And while you're while you're filling that in, I will just say that I've worked on this daily for the past 10 plus years. I'm I'm good 90% of the time. 10% I have to remind myself. But here's where I've come to find out people tell me stuff because they know I'm a good listener. People tell me stuff. And then when they're done, I don't know why I told you that. That's a superpower, especially if we're in the information gathering business. But if you're not a good listener, people won't tell you stuff. So any other thoughts out there? Uh, Tim says, I try to repeat the, point, the person's point back to them. Uh, Karen helps you to draw more insight from others and get others to open up more, correct? Okay. Uh, Adam asked a question on this. Would this be similar to repeating back the last thing the person said? That could be part of it too, yes. It's similar to that. But this is more of, this is more of an exercise versus a strategy you use when you have a conversation, but it also tells that person that you understood what they said, and then you're going to add on to it. Focus on listening all the way to the end of what if someone is, end of what someone is saying rather than formulating, right? Responses, wait till the full thought is expressed, correct? Makes people feel appreciated. Absolutely. Great. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Now, this one is about adaptability. And this game is called New Choices. And what we're going to do is Kristen's going to start to tell a story. And when you hear the, the bell ring, she's going to change that choice. So it could be, I'm going to be driving to Pittsburgh. Ding. I'm going to be driving to Cleveland. Ding. I'm going to be driving to Atlanta. And if the bell doesn't go off, she'll continue with the story until the bell goes off again. And then she'll have to make some changes here, some adaptability pieces. Um, let's talk a little bit about pools. Uh, I work for Pools R Us, the world's largest pool sales company, and uh, I just want to tell you about the different choices that you have available to you in the pool market as you make your choice, Peter, as a homeowner looking to install a pool in your backyard. So pools come in um, different sizes, and they also come in different shapes. And they also come in different depths. And what you may not know about pool depths is it really uh, has a strong correlation to your insurance. So if you don't, it has a strong correlation to breaking your neck. Um, so if you don't want to break your neck, you should get a deep pool. If you do like, you know, the option to break your neck or children breaking their necks, go with shallow um, and you can put a diving board in it, you know, then it's, it's all over. Uh, so different sizes, different depths, um, different shapes, different colors. Actually, the latest rage in 2020 because of the pandemic, you're bored, you're trying to figure out what can I do to make my home life more interesting because it's safe here. Uh, we offer different colored liners. So you can get purple, you can get, blue, you can get eggplant, you can get uh, crimson, you can get uh, striped. Striped is also you can, uh, you can also get uh, polka dots. People like polka dots. In fact, Peter, I thought that you might really like polka dots. So I'm looking at that plain black shirt. I think you might need to make these a little more exciting. So once you choose your liner color, um, we can get the trucks out there. We can start digging the big excavating hole that you'll need. Um, hopefully you have a location in mind, like your own backyard, uh, like uh, the side of your house. Uh, perhaps your driveway is where you want to put your pool. Uh, then you can park your car in the water, 
And uh, so we get, we get out there, you've got your location, you've got your liner chosen, you've picked your depth, and we get the trucks out, they start digging, and uh, it doesn't take too long, you know, maybe four to eight weeks, before we, maybe four to eight months before we can have four to eight years. It's a really predictable timeline to get your pool installed. And after you do, you know, you can schedule way out. At that point, you'll be able to have parties, people will be able to get together, and they can come to your pool and dive in and celebrate with you all the really great things that uh, you've done by creating a wonderful house for people to come visit. How about the pandemic? What we just, what was, what we're still going through, but it, it's when, it, when we first started, when we all had to work from home, we all had to adapt. And we had new choices all the time. And we had to make these choices, accept these choices and move forward. And the thing about new choices is I can't affect yesterday what was, what was said before, and I can't get too far ahead of myself. I have to be present in the moment and accept that what's given to me. So you, a lot of you said that you are improvisers. So you're already applying this into your business life. Then I would, I would ref, for those of you who are improv, I would reframe this and go, for those of you who are improvisers, how can you become more strategic? as it relates to the ability to adapt to a changing landscape and not be attached, that's something that we can't do. And for those of you who are realizing that you're an improviser, an improviser in life, what can you do to heighten this ability? And just real quickly, a few of you could drop some of your thoughts into the chat box on this topic, because this is the essence of, of improvisation. I took a strengths finder test about four, four or five years ago, and my number one strength was adaptability. My number two was empathy, another component of improv. And number four had to do with something around the listening area. And I know if I ever taken that, that test 10, 20 years ago, those wouldn't have been my strengths. It, adapt or die, someone said. Uh, yeah, I, and Nora, that is absolutely true. In the world of professional speaking, a lot of my colleagues, when the pandemic hits, say, I'm not doing virtual. This is going to be gone in a few months. And about seven months into it, a few of them adopted and learned how to present virtually. Others didn't. And um, a large majority of those folks went out of business. Um, Chris says, corporate life requires us due to many distractions, the to too many distractions, the organization goes. Um, requires this, this being the, the ability to be adaptable. I guess is my question. Chris, if you could add on into the chat box to that. Uh, Amy, said, Amy Miller says, knowing the goal of the conversation can help you strategically guide your improv to help get closer to opportunities and answers. Thank you. And James Stock says, adaptation can be minor or major. When my, when my courses went online, I had to re-engineer my courses. And in doing so, my evaluations from students were some of the best I've ever received. The trick is to continue this strategy to in future classes. Thank you, James. That's, that's spot on. Thank you. Hey, so here. So as we come to the end of the presentation, there's, there's three questions in the uh, q and if, if you have a question, drop it in there, but I'm going to play this one last clip, and it's from a Cadillac commercial. If you want to be bold, you have to go off script. If you want to be bold, you have to go off script. And in the title of the book, we spell script, S-C-R, exclamation point, B-T, we had developed that long before Cadillac came out with this commercial. And when, it, when this commercial, the certain commercial at this end, I can't tell you how many text messages or the emails that you got to find this commercial. They're talking about you. Okay. So let's get to some Q&A. Let me go back here. So from an anonymous attendee, that's an interesting first name. What gotchas should we look out for using yes and? I could see times where it could turn into a negative 
it could turn negative still. Once you understand the, the, the concept of yes and, then turn it into the philosophy of yes and, where I don't have to say yes and. It could be, you know, I hear what you're thinking and let's explore some ideas and, and just kind of bring that positive aspect to the conversation. And yes, it could still go negative, but that's, that's just a navigation piece. And at times we might just have to shut the conversation down and revisit it. Right? This, is, this is where the adaptability comes in. Uh, but if we, if we think yes and, and the concepts of moving conversations forward in a positive direction, and maybe use the philosophy of yes and, it's about agreement and adding on, it's, I'm going to answer Sarah's question because it's about empathizing and having empathy for the person you're having a conversation with. And empathy is about trying to understand how that person feels in their shoes, not how you would feel in their shoes, how they feel in their shoes, which requires a lot more effort. There's empathy and there's sympathy. I can sympathize with a lot of people but I can't empathize with them if I haven't experienced or don't understand it, where it's coming from, from their perspective. Um, let's say Adam had a question. How about for someone involved in something like compliance with a request? Can we do this in the, and are the rules to say no? Yes, there are rules to say no. And when someone's trying to not comply with the rules, that's when we can attempt the yes and philosophy. But if someone is grounded in what their, their thoughts and their position, and they're not willing to listen, as, as Wiseman said, you know, listening is the willingness to change it. And actually, Alan Alda was the one who came up with that quote. Listening is the willingness to change. I'm willing to listen to you because and allow you to maybe change me. But if I've got a bias, or I'm stuck in some, uh, stuck in agenda, stuck in some beliefs, and there's no way in heck that you can change me, then there's no listening happening. That listening is, is gone away. It becomes a dually monologue. And we see this every day. We, we, we see this every day in our lives. We see this in leaders, we see this in events. If we can drop biases, if we can accept other people for who they are and be able to understand them better, it goes a long way. It's this improv leadership. It's not about me, the leader. It's about the team. And the team always comes first. Uh, Diana, how can we consistently respond with yeses without emitting a patronizing attitude? Well, that's, that once again is adopting that yes and philosophy. Because people, at some point when we're going yes and, yes and, yes and, all they're hearing is yes, then I can do this. They're not here at the end. The yes becomes the green word. But so an example that I've used in the past is someone comes in and they got an idea. And I mean, my first time is that no, we can't do that, but okay, yes, tell me about your idea. So they begin, they pause and I go, oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. And did you think about this? The person says, yes, I thought about that. And they give an answer. Well, that's an interesting thought. I never thought about that. And did you think about this? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I researched that. I did that. I, I hear you. Good. It, it seems like you've done, done great work here. Got one thing though. Did you think about and and did you think about how am I going to sell this to my boss? Oh, I didn't think about that. I did not think about that at all. Okay, perfect. Well then, no, go back. Think about how I could sell this to my boss. Also, did you come up with the budget or an ask amount? I, I kind of do. Okay, just finalize all that and bring it back. So we've left them empowered. We've left them to go do all the while. There's a caveat. All the while, part of this conversation, as he go, as this person goes back, is when it comes back, you really have to sell me on this. And, and just so you know, I'm not sure if we can do it this year. 
we might be able to, but this might be something we may have to hold out until next year. So you're not shooting down the idea. Now we're bringing the, the timing within the corporate environment into the equation. So with that said, I need to turn this over to my good longtime friend, Barry, who's over in London, England, to wrap this up for me. But before I, you give it to Barry, thank you all for participating. Thank you all for attending. It was a great pleasure. And remember, adopt that business improv attitude. Well, yes, and thank you very much, Peter and Margaret Readers. Um, I just wanted to say and echo Christina's opening remarks. Um, we're thrilled uh, as the world's largest professional accountancy and finance body to be uh, partnering with uh, BGS. Uh, please shout out in the chat bar if you're a finance professional. Um, and if you're not, that's awesome too. Um, but what we wanted to do through our wealth of advice and resources is just point you to do things that you have access to um, by being a, <clears throat> a member of BGS as the Honor Society. Uh, these are two very accessible uh, programs that you can log on to using your special login on the BGS site around emerging topics in finance, how you could be a baseline expert in some of the, the cool things that are happening. Um, and also the digital mindset pack, which gives you a base understanding of all the, the key and emerging digital technologies. And whether you're a finance professional, or accounting professional, or not at all, um, I would recommend these thoroughly to whatever walk of life that you're in, um, because uh, they're really, really meant for, for business leaders as well, and uh, really give you a good base of knowledge. You get 20% off, which is awesome. Um, now, along with that, do remember, <clears throat> Do remember the uh, the offer that, that Peter gave you at the moment around his Kindle book on Amazon deadline of about uh, the end of uh, Tuesday, uh, April the 26th. And the chat bar is going crazy, but hopefully within the chat bar somewhere, uh, the link to the Amazon site is, oh, look at that, McKenna. The, the Amazon site um, has been uh, referenced for you there. Um, with that, I'm going to go read that chat bar. I'm going to actively listen to it, and I'm going to hand over to Christina. Well, thank you so much, Peter. That was a fascinating topic. Barry and Nora from AICPA and SEMA, thank you so much for joining. I want to thank all of our attendees today. Um, we will be sending a follow-up message, including some of the information that we've learned here today, as well as links to some of the programs. Um, I will give everyone just a minute to pop that Amazon link out of the chat before we end that live stream, because I know I will certainly be taking advantage of that discounted book. It's a fascinating topic, Peter. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, please, if anyone has any questions for the BGS staff, please feel free to reach out to us. We are here to support you and we value all of you as individual members of Beta Gamma Sigma. So I will leave the live stream up for just a couple of minutes if you'd like to grab anything out of the chat and then it will end. And thank you all so much again joining us today. Thank you for having me. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.